This is the BBC. This podcast is supported by advertising outside the UK. BBC Sounds. Music, radio, podcasts. Welcome to This Cultural Life, the show in which I ask leading creative figures about their formative influences, the people, places and cultural events that have shaped their own work. I'm John Wilson and my guest is Neil Tennant, singer, songwriter and one half of the Pet Shop Boys, the most successful British pop duo of all time. Along with Chris Lowe, his musical partner of over 40 years, Neil Tennant has made 14 studio albums, their wry observational lyrics, electronic dance beats and bittersweet melodies have seen the Pet Shop Boys sell over 100 million records worldwide. Neil Tennant, welcome to This Cultural Life. Hi, nice to be here. Um, you were born in North Shields in Tyneside and then moved to Newcastle, I think, when you were quite young. What did your parents do? My father was a sales rep. He sold industrial rubber goods like uh, conveyor belts and piping. So the garage always smelled of rubber, a smell to this day I don't like. Um, and my mother was what we used to call a housewife. Mm. There were four of children, so, it, I mean, it was yeah. a pretty full-on job, to be honest, for her. And what sort of cultural upbringing at home was there? Were, were there a lot of books at home, music? Yeah, there weren't that many books. There were some books from, from my father's childhood, actually. And, of course, the biggest cultural thing going on was pop music. You know, 1963, the Beatles exploded, so I was like eight or nine. And you could hear whoever was comparing it, you could hear people screaming outside the theatre on the television. And it was, it was really, really, really exciting. I thought I'd be a dead ringer for Ringo. <laughs> Are you ready? Sense of an event. Sense of an event. But just, and, and my father once drove us to the Newcastle City Hall to look at the queue. Of course, we were never going to go. You were too young. We were too time. young. But even say <laughs> the people, the people queuing in their sleeping bags to buy tickets, you were participating in Beatlemania. It's been a hard day's night. And then we all went and saw a Hard Day's Night when that came out when I was about 10 years old, which is a very thrilling thing because, of course, you see the Beatles performing live in it. And, and from then onwards, I started to think I wanted to be a pop singer. Did you sing at school? You went to a local Catholic school, didn't you? Yes. I don't remember seeing at primary school. When I went to St Cuthbert's Grammar School in Newcastle, I was 11, we had a quite a good music teacher. And I remember in the first year, we sang A Ceremony of Carols by Benjamin Britten, which I still like. Um, you were an altar boy as well, though, weren't you? I was an altar boy. That was another of my great first theatrical experiences. From the age of seven, I was an altar boy at the local Catholic church. I could say the entire Latin Mass from start to finish. My first ambition was to... Be, I wanted to be a priest. 
Really? I mean, really, I want to be the Pope, actually. And uh, <laughs> I liked all, I liked all the, the costumes. I liked the dressing up. Our parish priest had been an army chaplain and he had this enormous wardrobe in the sacristy of robes he'd had made in the Far East. I spent hours looking through them. And they were very, very beautiful and all these silks and colours and all these different fabrics. It was sort of fascinating. You know, it's a funny thing when you're an altar boy, you come out with your candle or something and all the audience stand up because you're with the priest. It's sort of a... You've got a taste for it. Uh, yeah, and you're, and you're doing all the responses. You know, as I said, at a very, very young age. But I sort of lost interest in it all, really. And that was that. But nonetheless, the ritual, the incense, the imagery... The robes. The robes. Uh, and, and the first sort of cultural thing, I used to go to the Theatre Hall in Newcastle on Saturday afternoons by myself and you'd queue up for the, what they called the gods. It cost, I don't know, a shilling or something and you'd run up all these stairs and be incredibly high up and I'd, I'd see um, things like the touring production of Oliver even amateur productions of operas and things like that. Were other friends interested in theatre? Was this particularly your thing? My mother realised I was interested in the theatre and she had this friend at church who was in the People's Theatre. Newcastle still has this famous amateur theatre called the People's Theatre, founded in, I think, the 20s, sponsored by George Bernard Shaw. And, and she said, you know, they have this young People's Theatre, maybe Neil would be interested. And so I started going on Saturday mornings and that's where I met all my friends rather than at school. I was no good as an actor, but I was fascinated by theatre and I wrote a play that was performed and I wrote a play that had songs in it that was, was performed. So For the People's Theatre? Yeah, uh, for the Young People's Theatre, yes. So you were creating the work rather than yes. act acting the work, mainly. Yes. But you were drawn to the stage, to performance, even I from that age. I was just drawn to... I'm sort of, to this day, a bit stage-struck, really. I like the whole thing. I like putting the show together. I like the smell of backstage. I like the magic of thinking something through and putting it on, the curtain goes up and there it is. There's something about the theatre that... Uh, and live concerts. The first live concert I ever saw was at the Newcastle Festival in 1968. And it was a group called John Heisman's Coliseum who were a sort of prog jazz fusion group. What I liked was the lighting. <laughs> I didn't know about lighting like that. Well, the fact that it could be so dramatic in itself. Yeah. I was quite entranced by the whole thing, even though I didn't love the music, to be honest. But I liked the whole experience. The first significant moment that you've chosen for this cultural life is buying your first guitar. Did you have lessons? Or were you just listening to records and trying to emulate what you were hearing? Um, you know, in those days, on the BBC Two, I suppose, it just started... They had a guitar programme and I bought the book. Like a tutorial, how to play yes, the guitar. how to play. It was like folk guitar, finger-picking, really. Yeah. Hello there, so you want to play the guitar. Well, it's not so difficult, but you must be prepared to practice every day. If you and also I had the book everyone has ever had written, which is called Play in a Day by Bert Whedon, mm. which teaches you chords and stuff. So I taught myself. I actually had two guitar lessons, but when I got there, I thought, oh, I can already do this. So I didn't go to any more. And then really I became interested in just writing my own songs. I've got exercise books at home. They're all written out very neatly with the chords. And they're not very good, but I get to know chord changes because of teaching myself chords on the piano. All my music's been chord-based, which is quite pop, actually. Mm. And so I would play... We had one book of 50 Beatles songs, and so I would play all the chord changes, just following the guitar notation at the top, not the actual piano notation, which I would still do, by the way. And so I, from a very early age, I was great on chord changes. And as soon as I learned a chord, I would write a song. If I learned A minor seventh or something, I would write a song based on A minor seventh. And so I was doing that really quite seriously from about the age of 13. So you bought a guitar, you started learning the piano at the same time. I taught myself both. I was self-taught, yes. And then formed a band. And that's another significant moment in your creative development, I guess. What, tell me what, what the band was. Well, what the band was... There were four of us. It was called Dust. We were very... In, I had a friend, Chris Dowell, who loved the incredible string band. And in between the Beatles ending and sort of David Bowie coming along... That was the era of music I didn't like. It was sort of heavy metal and Led Zeppelin and Jethro Tull. Read your book and lose yourself in the 
none of his thoughts He might tell you about what is or even about what is not the Incredible Stone Band, the strange, whimsical group, two men and two women, and they played a huge variety of instruments, hence the name The Incredible String Band. And they were a cult thing, and we got into that. And, and even their shows were kind of theatrical. They used to perform what they called parables in them. <laughs> and it was all very hippie. And so Dust was very much inspired by The Incredible String Band. The first song um, I wrote that I thought was a good song uh, which I'm not embarrassed by even now, was called Can You Hear the Dawn Break? And it was very folky. And we actually got a session on BBC Radio Newcastle. We did four or five songs that were broadcast at breakfast in the morning. Does that recording exist? Uh, yeah, I have the tape of myself, yes. Really? Um, Can we hear that? Uh, um, you could probably hear a bit of it. It's 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 what for this. Yes. <laughs> yeah, I could probably send you, I could send you a song. It's... Is it recognisably a Neil Tennant song? No, I don't. Well, I don't know. I don't think so. It's a, it's a, woman, a young girl singing it. Um, but in terms of the, the structure of the song, the words... No, it's more folky than I, than I became. Baby, can you hear the dawn break? Can you see the sunshine? Do you still play guitar for pleasure? Yes, a bit. A bit. Not and I so say that much. Because people associate you obviously so clearly with dance music, with electronic music, they do, with synthesizer. Yes. Yeah. Do you write or have you throughout the Pet Shop Boys written on the guitar? Yeah, less so, but yes. During lockdown, I started recording songs I'd written in the 70s and they were on the guitar. And you recorded them on the So I recorded a couple of them, yeah. Um, Hang on, you're talking about a Neil Tennant solo folk album then? And Chris said to me, you know, these aren't, this isn't, I don't know if you want to do anything with these, but this isn't the Pet Shop Boys. Some of them are quite funny. Uh, You can recognise the sort of Neil Tennant humour thing. Some of them are very wistful. Uh, I've always had a tendency to be wistful anyway. There's one really beautiful one, actually, uh, I'm quite proud of. Do you think we'll hear this album? It's not really an album, it's about five songs at the moment, but... Um, you can build on that, surely. Yeah, I don't know, maybe. I've got no plans for it, though. You moved to London in the early 70s to study history at the North London Polytechnic and then worked in publishing as an editor. Who, who and what were you editing? Well, I started applying for jobs in book publishing and finally I got a job with the publishers that did educational books. We did sort of hobby books, uh, like playing chess, tropical fish, French cooking I edited. And then I was briefly Mary Berry's editor. I edited the Mary Berry ITV cookbook in 1981. Uh, (laughs) And it's funny, I used to think, whatever happened to Mary Berry? Have you met her since? Have you discussed your work with her? I haven't. There's a precision and an elegance, I think, to a lot of your lyrics. Do they benefit from having worked as an editor? I think, I mean, I worked in various kinds of publishing for 10 years for the Pet Shop Boys, from Marvel Comics to Smash Hits. I was also a freelance copy editor for Faber and Faber. I've always been an editor, even now. And a self-editor, more importantly. Yes, even now I think, why don't we cut that out, you know, and or move that around? It's just, it's a sort of instinct I have. Um, Do you think it's affected any of the lyrics and the way that we hear them? Because you have a a certain editorial rigour. Yeah, in terms of... um, you know, stripping them back a bit. Not too many adjectives. <laughs> and what about the music scene in the late 1970s in London? You're working in the day, going out at night, I presume. And this is a time of huge cultural and political change going on. I like sort of new wave music by this point. So I would be sitting at home writing songs on my acoustic guitar. I never had an electric guitar. And with a really terrible tape recorder um, recording them. And every now and then I'd answer an advert in The Melody Maker and I'd go, I remember getting the bus across Clapman Common with my guitar and and playing three or four songs to this guy who wanted to start a group. And it was quite encouraging in a way because he told me I was too good 
He said, but you'll end up being the front man. I said, what do you think? <laughs> when did you buy your first synthesizer? When was that shift from acoustic guitar to 81. Synth? That was the way music was going. I mean, me and my friends, all those friends from the youth theatre, by the way, all moved to London. We all still knew each other. I remember being at someone's basement flat in Kilburn and the Man Machine by Kraftwerk had just come out. And it was so perfect and minimal and precise. And it made me think how much I loved the sound of electronic music, almost the soulful sound of it, and also how it's sort of like Mozart, it's, it's lines, it's like chamber music, really. I had a bit of redundancy money left, and so I bought a Korg MS-10, which I didn't realise was a monophonic synthesizer. I didn't really know what monophonic meant. It means we can play one note at a time. <laughs> and chords have been so important to you. And chords are so important to me. So I thought... Uh, and also, I got it home and I plugged it in and nothing came out because I assumed it had a speaker in it. <laughs> and it didn't. So I went down to the local hi-fi shop on the King's Road and got them to weld a jack plug to the thing I could stick in the back of my stereo system. And that's when Chris Lowe walked in the shop. Um, as you were buying a lead? As I was having a, a lead sold. They wouldn't do this now, would they? This is, this is middle ages, practically. There, there's a guy soldering it. You know, you could smell the burning the, from, coming from the back of the shop. And Chris Lowe walked in while that was uh, happening? Yes, he, he walked in while that was happening. And, and what happened? Well, there was no one serving because he was soldering this lead for me. And we just started talking. He says, I know when he was on there. And I said, oh, he's, he's doing this thing for me. And, um, and we started talking. About, and Chris liked electronic music. And we both liked um, Soft Cell. And we both quite liked OMD at a single, which I still love, called Souvenir. We both liked that. I gave him my phone number. He didn't have a phone number, I don't think. And uh, a few days later, he phoned me up and he came over to look at the synthesizer by now plugged into the stereo system and I had my acoustic guitar and so Chris was evidently quite a good keyboard player that was completely evident immediately and so I played the chords the all-important chords on my guitar and he played on the synthesizer and that was the beginning and did you start writing songs straight away then yes more or less I think even on the first day we sort of wrote a bit of something it wasn't very good but was there an agreement or a recognition from both of you that there was something important, something special happening here? Well, it was something to do. You know, it was like a hobby in the evening. Chris was, was an architect, but he was doing a year working in architectural practice. You know, so in the evenings he might come over and then we'd go to the Chelsea Potter pub for a drink <laughs> afterwards, you know. Yeah. And, um, and then one day Chris went to, one weekend, Chris went to Blackpool and home and he came back with a cassette of himself playing the piano and said, see if you can do anything with this. And I wrote the song Jealousy over it. And it was actually really inspired by a, a good friend of mine who was jealous that I'd suddenly got friendly with this Chris Lowe character and I wasn't seeing as much of him. Was he an old friend from Newcastle? That's right, yes. Me and this friend from Newcastle had a little sort of a row about it. But, and so that went into Jealousy. And that was the first proper song we wrote. Where you been? Who you see? You didn't phone when you said you would. Do you lie? Do you try to keep in touch? You know you could have tried to see your point of view. Could not hear or see for jealousy. Where you been? Who you see? And then we had some other ideas. And still with the, the remaining bit of my legendary redundancy money, which I was obviously eking out quite impressively, <laughs> I looked in the back of the melody maker and there was a guy at a studio called Camden 8 off Camden Road and we went in there to make a demo of three songs and one of them was Jealousy. One of them was very much written on my Korg MS-10 and it was funny, it was a spoken word piece. It's humorous, it's called Oh Dear. And then typical Chris, when we got there, we'd rehearse something and he said, I want to do this new thing I've written. And we did this other song. And anyway, the guy who did it was mixed them for us and gave us the cassettes. 
And he said, you know, you guys have got something, I think. Um, if you like, you could use my studio. And if it gets anywhere, maybe I'd have a share of publishing. And we said, yeah, OK, great. And it's called Ray Roberts. And and that's when we really... And in Ray Roberts' studio, there was a upright piano, which I would play, electric piano, Rhodes piano, and there was a synthesizer of some description. And also, I would play the desk, which was all went into... Because it was like a four-track cassette recorder thing. But you could have, it had, all importantly, reverb. <laughs> and so I would just put fiddle around with, I would sit there singing, putting effects on my voice. And, and it was fun. We weren't take, we were taking it seriously and not taking it seriously at the same time. And then we go out and have a Greek meal in Camden Town office. And that was when suddenly we had a load of songs. But you said a moment ago one of those first things you recorded was a spoken word piece. Yes. And that's something that's been all the way through your work, that sort of yeah. half singing, half yeah. speaking thing. Yeah. Where did that come from? Were you influenced by any particular records or performance? Well, remember, rap music had just started. Chris and I loved this. I, mean, I always give credit to it. The Message by Grandmaster Flash. Of course, by now I've joined Smash Hits. As a journalist, as a as music a journalist. journalist. So I could start going to tons of gigs. And I always remember going with a friend of mine to see a gig with Grandmaster Flash at the venue in Victoria, as it was called then. So there was an influence of rap. So when we wrote Western Girls, it was meant to sound like The Message by Grandmaster Flash. Smoking glass everywhere, people pissing on the stage, you know they just don't care. I can't take the smell, can't take the door, I've got no money to provide, I guess I got no choice. Rats in the front room, roaches in the back. David Bowie is your next choice for this cultural life. Do you remember the first time you ever heard Bowie, or possibly more importantly, saw him? My brother and I used to stay up and watch the Old Grey Whistle Test, which was on quite late, I think about 11 o'clock at night. One programme, the Old Grey Whistle Test, starts with David Bowie singing Five Years. Pushing through the market square So many mothers crying Simon, my brother and I, both thought he was just amazing. It was completely amazing. Had five years left and what was it? The performance, the, the voice? The performance, the charisma, the look, the orange hair. Um, he was wearing that sort of snakeskin jumpsuit thing. It was just like nothing else. It was cold and it rained, so I felt like an actor and a thought. Face, your race, the way that you walk. I kiss you, you're beautiful. I want you to walk. We've got five years. Did you see him on the Ziggy Stardust tour yeah. of 1972? And then all my friends and I, we sort of shifted, I'm afraid, from the Incredible String Band to David Bowie. And then in June 1972, and I was in the middle of my A levels, he played the Newcastle City Hall and we all went. And we were really quite near the front it was half empty and when he came on it was just you were completely knocked out five years rain hurts a lot five years that's all we got and also he was he said he was gay and this was a kind of a fascinating thing that he was gay even though of course he wasn't as we all now know but um and that, there was something about that that was and very unusual to say you were gay. Um, was that part of the appeal at the time? No, uh, it was part of the mystique. And there was a lot of mystique going on. There was a lot of, with David Bowie. And we became really obsessive. And my friends and I, we start going to this one gay bar in Newcastle. And even though we don't, as we would now say, identify as gay, we like the fact that it's Different. <laughs> uh, so you went out at the time? No, no. I, mean, I probably had find... some sort of gay experience, but then I had some sort of heterosexual experience too. So we were all wanted, we wanted to be different. I didn't want to be like everyone else at school. I didn't want to, like football, get a car when I was 17. I used to go around telling people I was going to be a pop star. And I was v so unlikely as a pop star. Even when I became a pop star, I was unlikely as a pop star. So the androgyny of Bowie must have been, even though, as you say, he said he was gay, probably wasn't yes. in that way. But that was part of the appeal of somebody who... Bowie is where everyone says he's androgynous, but he's sort of quite masculine at the same time. But yeah, yeah. Uh, but it's just the fact that 
there are no boundaries. That's what really appeals. There are no boundaries. And also, again, this very, very theatrical delivery. A, a friend, a girlfriend and I used to go to Windows, the sort of classical music shop in Newcastle after school, and they had stereo listening booths where you could go and listen to Bruckner's Fourth or something. And we used to say, oh, can we hear Hunky Dory by David Bowie, please? And can we hear it in the stereo listening booth? Uh, you know, it was enormously irritating, so we were never going to buy it. But even now, the start of the Hunky Dory album changes with the piano chords and the sax. I'm back in the stereo listening booth at Windows in Newcastle. And it's, it's magic. Still don't know what I was waiting for And my time was running wild A million dead-end streets And every time I thought I got it made It seemed the taste was not so sweet So I turned myself... And this is the thing I've always loved about music is when you can't really understand it, when it's more than the sum of its parts. It's, there's a sort of magic. And David Bowie had that magic quality. You worked with Bowie in the 90s, didn't you? You did, did a, yes. a Pet Shop Boys remix of one of his tracks at the time, Hello Space Boy. How did that come about? Oh, I went to see with my friend, the writer John Savage, who went to see David Bowie's tour of Outside, the last time he made with Brian Eno. And there was a backstage meet and greet thing afterwards. And uh, and he obviously knew I was. And I said, oh, why didn't you release? It's a very typical me thing to say. Why didn't you release this as a single? Because uh, sometimes it annoys me when people have got a really good song and they don't use it. And then he had the song Hello Space Boy. And he said, well, maybe you guys should mix it for me. And I said, oh, that'd be great. And anyway, my recollection is two days later, he phoned up, you know. And so I got a phone call saying, David Bowie's going to call you up. And I said, and I had two friends around, and I said, when the phone rings, answer it, because it's going to be David Bowie, and you can speak to David Bowie. Anyway, and he said, would you do this? And so Chris and I remixed it. And when we analysed the song, it only had one verse. So Chris and I wrote another verse, and Chris said, why don't you do what David Bowie does and cut up one of his songs? And so he decides to cut up Space Oddity. You, like a collage technique? Yes. Cut up the lyrics. So, we just, so I printed out the lyrics of... Space Oddity and cut them up, and it, I mean, it wasn't particularly fascinating, really. But it brought it brought Major Tom into it, and Hello Space Boy I really like because it's got David Bowie's classic themes of sexual androgyny. It's confusing these days, and space. And he phoned up in the middle of this, and I said, oh, "Well, we've we've made a new verse by cutting up Space Oddity." He didn't sound very happy. He said, mm, <laughs> "Sounds like I better come in." And he came in and we played it to with me singing as a demo. And he loved it. And he said, yeah, but you'll have to keep singing it. And, and I said, and it's got Major Tom. I said, it's like Major Tom's in one of those Russian spaceships they can't afford to bring down anymore. And Bowie said, oh, that's where he is now. And he just entered into the fantasy. And, and I loved that. Ground to Major, bye-bye. You performed with them, I think, on top of the Pops and at the Brit Awards. And the Brits, yes. What has been Bowie's most important influence, do you think, on your work with the Pet Shop Boys? No boundaries. A fearlessness. You can write a song about anything. Don't be afraid to be arty-farty. Theatre. If I return to the Ziggy Stardust show uh, at Newcastle City Hall in 72, it seemed very theatrical. Actually, it's almost a standard rock show. They're just wearing some costumes. But... By the standards of the time, it, there's artifice there. And the following year in London, I see three times the Aladdin Sane show. And he's got all those Japanese costumes. And that's a really amazing beginning of the show when he comes on. They pull the costume away from the sides. And so it was always for me going to be instinct that if you're ever in a situation where you're going to do a tour, it was going to be theatrical, like David Bowie. Your next choice 
for this cultural life is the Heaven nightclub in London in the early uh, 1980s. Why Heaven in particular? Well, Heaven was a big club. There would be, I don't know, 2,000 people in there maybe, or 1,500 people. It had lights. I think it had lasers. So it was a real nightclub. There would be different generations. I mean, it was... It wasn't only gay men, but it was it obviously was, it was a gay men's club. It was the music in particular in the early eighties. You know, disco has been declared dead in America, but of course it just carries on anyway. And what happens is disco becomes very electronic, and we discover there's a guy called Bobby Orlando in New York is making a lot of these records that we love, and discover this record called Passion by the Flirts. And it becomes the template for what we think the Pet Shop Boys should be, this this hard electronic sound. And then when we go to heaven, we hear these incredible electronic dance records which go on forever as well like Native Love by Divine So this is the first place really, or one of the first places in Britain where you can hear this kind of electronic music and house you music probably could. You probably could at gay clubs around the country to be fair. But how important was it that it was a gay club and sharing experiences with other gay men at the time in the early 80s when so much was at stake? Again it's the sort of magic thing it's a bit nerve wracking It's slightly scary going to a gay club because it means you're gay. (laughs) And you had identified as a gay man by this time? Uh, I was starting to. And one of the things that makes me do that is actually, weirdly, the music, to be honest. Uh, All this incredible music. And Chris and I decided we want to make that kind of music. And also, you only hear this music in gay clubs. By the mid to late 80s, it's become the sound of pop music. So going down the same route, we've got Stock Egg and Waterman early on. New Order do Blue Monday, which is exa- again exactly the kind of record Chris and I want to make. And I'm at Smash It's, we're not releasing records. And the Pet Shop Boys, who are unknown, but you've got those New Order Pet Shop Boys and Stock Egg and Waterman, and they're all doing this digga 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 sequence of electronic dance music. Mm. And so that's a very, very powerful thing, just going in the main dance floor at Heaven lasers and lights and these pulsating sequences. It's a very heady atmosphere. There's a sense of celebration there, euphoria, but also within the gay scene, apart from the fact that actually there's a lot of violence and persecution of the gay community at the time, but also... You're facing, not long after that, the AIDS crisis in HIV. Yeah, the AIDS thing comes along. That is reflected in some of your lyrics for the Pet Shop Boys, isn't it? A little bit later, yes, because my friend from Newcastle, who's gay, who's, who's been an out gay since the mid-70s, really, he gets AIDS. He's diagnosed in 1986. So this is when the Pet Shop Boys have taken off. Mm. I wrote the lyric for a song called It Couldn't Happen Here... And it was just looking back at a conversation he and I had had in about 85, saying, oh, he just read in the, in the Independent or something that they're not expecting this gay cancer thing to take off in the UK like it has in America because people's behaviour in America is more extreme or some nonsense like that. And then, of course, it does happen and he gets it. In fact, he dies of it by the end of the decade. Another single from around this time, West End Girls. It seems to be very filmic characters ducking in and out of the back streets. Sometimes you're better off dead. There's a gun in your hand that's pointing at your head. You think you're mad, too unstable. Kicking in chairs and knocking down tables in a restaurant in a West End town. Do you remember writing that song? I do, yes. Uh, I was at my cousin Richard's house and we were watching a James Cagney movie. 
And then I went to bed and just turned the light off. The lines came into my head. I had to write it down. Sometimes you're better off dead. There's a gun in your hand. It's pointing at your head. And and then I went to sleep. You know, I didn't think about it much more. And then I started to write this as a rap, lying on my lying on the floor in my little bed, sit on the King's Road, thinking of Grandma's to Flash. And I was writing in, oh, sometimes you're better off dead. There's a gun in your hand. It's pointing at your head. You think you're mad. Two in stable. And I'm trying to, I'm trying to be a, a New York rapper. <laughs> and I go into the studio and Chris and the guy's studio is Ray Roberts is there. And I recite the whole thing to them. And in those days, the West End girls bit is spoken as well. In a West End town, a damn world, the East End boys and West End girls. And it was, you know, it was quite impressive. I mean, I thought it was quite impressive. And, um, and they were saying, well, yeah, God, that's really good, yeah. And then ages later, we wrote an instrumental piece of music. And I was at home and I thought, oh, God, you can do that rap thing over this. And then sing the chorus when the chords move up. And so that became West End Girls. A lot of Pet Shop Boys, their songs are character studies, they're vignettes, and very often using everyday phrases Always, and common yes. speech, left to my own devices. What have I done to deserve this? Um, I wouldn't normally do this sort of thing. Does lyrical inspiration often come in the middle of a conversation? Yes. And also, just the things people say, you know. I was listening when I walked down the street, I was listening to people's conversations. The snatches, you know, of things people say as they're walking past you. When Lil's husband got demobbed, I said, I didn't mince my words, I said to her, myself, hurry up, please, it's time. I always loved the poem, The Wasteland by T.S. Eliot, even though I don't really understand it to this day. Um, but I love all the different voices. Was that money he gave you to get yourself some teeth? He did. I was there. You know, when it's the good, good night, night, ladies, good night, good night and... Uh, the women talking in the pub, the women on the top of the bus. I love the idea of having a collage of voices. Good night, ladies. Good night, sweet ladies. Good night. Good night. And so in writing West End Girls, I was also thinking of writing a collage of different voices. So it's not just one voice all the way through. It's dialogue in pop music, though, It's isn't dialogue, it? yes, it is. Like um, little plays. It's like found dialogue, really. Yeah, exactly. Do you think you're a particularly English songwriter in that way? Well, when I did wrote the lyrics of West End Girls, I wrote them in an American accent. But then when we came to make the record, which actually was by that point in New York, I thought I'm not going to say it in an American accent because that would be corny. And it was quite difficult because the rap leads you into American... I always remember the assistant engineer saying, oh, your voice is so easy to listen to. And, um, and, and they loved the fact I was doing it in an English voice. Also, you know, I had the things I'd read over the years. I'd always like Evelyn Waugh's books and stuff like that. And that sort of English satire. So I wanted my voice. And the Beatles, mm. you know, Strawberry Fields Forever and, and Penny Lane are very English, aren't they, really? And I came from a similar sort of thing. And I wanted our songs to reflect the world going on around us. That's the musical and lyrical tone. But just thinking back to the title of your 1990 hit single, Being Boring, which I think came from a gig review which said that you were just being boring on stage. Do you enjoy performing now? Yes, what we did then, although it was, in the early days it was nerve-wracking, you know. I mean, remember, Chris and I's first gig in London was th three nights at Wembley Arena. And because you were had such hit records... It wasn't... We, yes, we, it's, we weren't a geeking rock band, you know, we wrote songs. And throughout the 80s, when the Pet Shop Boys thing had taken off, we did promotion, we did TV shows and interviews, and we made records and wrote songs. So we had to work on that. But we had the theatre thing to draw upon. So we worked with Derek Jarman, who we'd made videos with. And we had the idea of having huge films. That, that, believe it or not, there was a time when that wasn't a cliche. And, um, and Derek made these Super 8 films and blew them up. And that was really, really exciting. We didn't want there to be lulls in our gigs. We wanted things to keep happening, which we thought we could only get through theatre. 
You know, halfway through the Derek Jarman show, suddenly all these crazy, cre- the seven deadly sins appear. And, we, and of course, it's, it's a sin. It just occurred to me that you formed over 40 years ago. We did, now. yes. No, it's remarkable. That's astonishing when you think no, it of is. it like that. And the Pet Shop Boys have never been away. It's been a really pretty consistent no, stream of albums, yeah. singles, performances. Yeah. What do you put that longevity down to, do you think? We have a lot of creative energy, and we're very lucky to have that. And I think it's because the source of it is some sort of pleasure in creating you know, if Chris and I weren't releasing records, we'd probably still make them, and I would play them at home and think, oh, I love this one. And that's really the what drives the whole thing. And you started off and remain and have always been a pop group, in effect. You make pop music, and you're now in your 60s. You, you can't be too old for pop music then. If you were too old for it, you wouldn't be enjoying it. Mm. Um, so you wouldn't be doing it. My interest in contemporary pop music is not that great. And maybe that's because of my age, which would be a totally reasonable thing. It, to me, pop music nowadays is very narcissistic. I find can find that a bit tedious. So, But as far as our pop music goes, I don't know. Sometimes I wonder whether we've just become old-fashioned because we write quite complicated melody lines. And lyrics, because you're still an observational lyricist. And I'm still an observational lyricist. Is that why you don't like a lot of contemporary pop? Because it's so... Um... I don't know, self-referential. It's just about, it's like a sort of diary, which I mean, can be interesting. Sometimes I wish there was more art in it, though, rather than, you know, dissing your boyfriend or something. You know, David Bowie wasn't really Ziggy Stardust. Marvin Gaye wrote What's Going On in response to the Vietnam War. Where's the record responding to the Ukraine war? Where's the fantastic pop song about Putin? I don't know, it's as though it's not the concern of pop music. Well, I think it is the concern of pop music. Neil Tennant, thank you very much indeed for joining me on This Cultural Life. Thank you. Hello, this is Jane Garvey with some good news. Life Changing is back and I can honestly tell you that we have found some really remarkable individuals for this series. People who've lived through extraordinary life-changing moments. Now here's just a quick taster of what's in store for you. And I was calling Mayday, Mayday, Mayday and a ship answered and I thought, thank goodness, we've got the starboard railings are in the water, we're rolling around and we're sinking. So he said, what is your position? So I said, we're about halfway between the port of East London and Durban. No, what, what are your coordinates, he says. So I said, well, I don't know what the coordinates are. And I could hear sort of, what rank are you? So I said, well, I'm, I'm, I'm not a ranker, I'm a guitarist. And he said, what are you doing on the bridge? So I said, well, there's nobody else here. You might need a, a strong brew and some steady nerves for that one. It's quite a story. Honestly, I've been blown away by what so-called ordinary human beings are capable of. Don't miss this series of life-changing. These stories and these people are definitely going to improve your day. Join us if you can. Subscribe now to Life Changing on BBC Sounds.